Hello and welcome back to Planet Sail and welcome to episode 5 of On Course, our regular look at the sailing world. Now it's midsummer here in the UK and it's an absolute scorcher. And whilst the racing has been a little bit sparse, at least we've been out on the water. I've been able to get my RS400 down here and race in the Solent and it's been fantastic. I was also lucky enough to sail on a boat at the other end of the size scale and it blew me away. More on that later. So, in this episode... The big sprint to Iceland and back. Plus, how a sailboat builder is leading the way for green power. But first, how often do you get to play with a 9 million pound super yacht? Well, over the last 28 years, I've been very lucky in being able to test literally hundreds of boats all over the world, some of them with a price tag very much like this. But the Spirit 111 is something else. She first caught my eye when we went up to Ipswich to go and see Spirit Yachts' operation. She'd just been launched. Well, now she's in the water, she's up and running, and she is something else. Here's why. It's quite fitting that Spirit Yacht's latest launch, the 111, should be revealed to the public here in Gosport on the south coast of the UK. Why? Because we're at Endeavour Keys, formerly known as Camper and Nicholson's, and while that was famous for many yachts, they were particularly well known for the spectacular J-Class yachts of the 1930s. Shamrock 5, Velsheda, Endeavour 1 and 2, all four of them were built here. So why the connection? Well, because the 111 is the largest slooped rig yacht to have been built in wood in the UK since Shamrock back in 1930. There's another link too. The J-Class were well known for representing the leading edge of design and technology in their day. Just like this boat here. So we've just headed out of Endeavour Keys and we've just slipped out through the narrow entrance to Portsmouth Harbour out into the Solent and what a fantastic day to come for a sail trial. The sea breeze is built, we've got 10 to 12 knots, it's absolutely gorgeous out here. Now the first thing that strikes you about this boat is how different it is to a normal boat and it only really struck me as we started to get moving because normally the audible warning to most of the crew that you're about to leave is turning the diesel engine on. It starts with that familiar beep and then the dum 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 gives everybody notice we're about to go. Not on this boat. With an electric motor, you press the button, you're off. There's no noise apart from the quiet hum of the electric motor and the prop spinning beneath you. We've only been out about 20 minutes I suppose and already I'm beginning to realise how pertinent that comparison with the J-Class really is. Because for anybody who's been able to sail one, it's not a big list but I'm very proud to be on it, will know that sailing a J-Class often involves more than 20 crew. There's five of us aboard this boat and all I've done so far is to film it. Hoisting the main and unfurling the jib it's no more difficult than pressing a couple of buttons 
on a remote control that's barely any bigger than your iPhone. There's nothing particularly new in that. It's just pretty impressive when you look up at the size of this mainsail. It's a whopper and no one has yet broken out in a sweat. So where has this project come from? At the beginning we were talking to the, the now owner of this yacht um, about what he wanted. Um, and his concept to start with was a, a 90 foot-ish yacht. Um, for him to sail, he's a young man in his mid-30s, um, he wanted a yacht that he could use like any other yacht, just a little bit bigger, more comfortable for him to use. So he wanted to cook in the galley. He didn't really want crew on board. He wanted to make the system, sailing systems really easy for him. But more importantly, it was the aesthetics of the boat. It had to be really beautiful. Uh, we did a, made a model of the 90 footer. Um, and he came and looked at his model and it was about this size. He looked at it and says, looks, does looks wrong. Can we stretch it and make it longer? And that's how it came to be 111 feet long and we kept the freeboard exactly the same height as a 90 footer as 111. So if you look at the boat, she's got a very low freeboard, she sits very low in the water, she feels like you're, you're involved in the sailing. So that was hugely important. On the helm is yet more surprises, or maybe I shouldn't say surprises. Anybody who's sailed a spirit yacht will know that one of their characteristics is that they're beautifully balanced and an absolute pleasure to sail. This is no different. What an amazing boat. So light on the helm, so direct, and so easy to steer. And it's easy to get lulled into thinking, because there's only five of us on board, it's really only taking three of us to go through the tacks. It's easy to get lulled into thinking that She's nowhere near as big as 111 foot, but she certainly is. When the sails flog, you're reminded of that. You can feel the load, you can feel the power in this boat. But what a remarkable machine. And yet again, I find myself comparing it to a J-Class. And one of the boats that I'm most proud of having helmed was Endeavour many years ago, one of the J-Class yachts. And I was blown away by that. And it sort of set a standard, in my head anyway, for super yachts. And this is just on a par with that. And it's a yet another example of how far things have moved on. This is a boat, as I keep saying, on at the scale of a J-Class yacht, sailed by just five of us on board. Push button technology, I can just push a button down here to ease the main out if I want to, or just bring it in. There's nothing particularly new in that, but in the context of this boat, this elegant 111 foot cruiser, makes for something really quite special. So what else do you notice about this boat? Well, the things that don't really spring to mind until you start reading down the spec list is how advanced this boat is. For a start, it's got a carbon mast. Again, nothing particularly unusual in that in the super yacht world. She's got composite rigging. It all helps to keep the weight down and keep the writing moment up, which is one of the things that contributes to the performance of this boat and also helps with the balance and the whole feel. The winches are also something that are quite interesting on this boat. First of all, there's not that many of them. And secondly, they're backwinding winches. And that makes trimming an awful lot easier and indeed a lot safer, particularly with a sailplane of this size. But for all her elegance on the outside, I suspect it's her appearance on the inside that'll be the biggest talking point. Designed by Rhodes Young, the accommodation is based around the shape of an S. With the circular saloon and just four sleeping cabins hogging the prime part of the boat, you might think that there's a lot of wasted space. But when the finished product looks like this, surely it's a price worth paying. And anyway, if nothing else, the weight is low down in the middle of the boat, so what's not to like?
Okay, that's enough of that. It's time for some machinery. The yacht does have two diesel generators on board. It also has a sewage plant uh, here that uh, treats all the sewage of the yacht so nothing discharged over the side is nasty. We have also great access to the fuel filters, and the water systems, and further forward we have what is the, called the Vortex from Lumar, which is a hydraulic system that allows us to carry only 25 litres of oil in, in our tank rather than what would traditionally be a thousand litres. And that system works absolutely brilliantly, it spins out the air, it cools the oil and reuses it. So when you come to do an oil change, you only need to take out 25 litres and replace it. And below that is the main 100 kilowatt torpedo propulsion motor. It's tiny and very effective. But it wasn't just about propulsion, that actually was the easiest bit for us to solve. The harder bit was looking at the rest of the yacht and working out where it was going to use power and how we could save it. So the air conditioning is a variable speed compressor and that allows us to, at night, use much less power so the, the batteries can run the air conditioning for about 10 hours without worrying. So you would use the generators for an hour before you went to bed, top the batteries up, cool the boat with the air conditioning and then allow it to run until the morning when you don't want it anymore. We've also looked at how things like hot water work. The way we would got around that is we used a diesel burner but very precise burning of diesel to make, take all the heat it makes and put it straight into the hot water. And that way, it only runs for a few minutes and it's warmed the hot water back up. And we've gone through that with all the systems from refrigeration to lighting, everything we've done has been designed so it uses the least amount of power on the yacht and allowing you the batteries to go further when if you have to motor. And I reckon if you were sailing every day three, four hours and regenerating through the propeller, you would need to charge the, the batteries from the generator every three days. But there are some areas of this boat that I'm sure are going to raise some questions. A lot of it is based around practicality. After all, down below decks, there's hardly any handholds. Look at this huge, great, wide open foredeck. It's beautiful. But what kind of a nightmare would that be, trying to get across it when you're going upwind in a big sea with waves breaking across this deck, particularly given how low the freeboard is? There are all kinds of areas of this boat where you could potentially pick holes and say, ah, oh, well, it hasn't got a dedicated chart table and all oh, the galley isn't gimballing and the rest of it. But that's not what this boat's about. And although I've not met him, it sounds like the owner has been crystal clear on this. This is a project in creating something that's beautiful. Beautiful to look at, beautiful to be on, and beautiful to sail. And if that means making some compromises elsewhere, so be it. So given that I started this by comparing it to the J-Class boats of the 1930s, and while this isn't a racing boat, it's been designed specifically for cruising with the odd regatta in mind, I just wonder what the owners of those J-Class yachts, Sopwith and Lipton, would think about this one. I think they'd be pretty impressed. They were well known for wanting to push at the envelope, push at the boundaries, develop technology. And this boat certainly does that. With so much racing around the world being cancelled or postponed, it was a huge relief to see one of the first offshore races get underway. The Vendée Arctique was a two and a half thousand mile blast up to Iceland and back for 20 of the Amoka 60s as they prepared for the Vendée Globe later on this year. With a mix of old and new and plenty of untested kit, this was always going to be a fascinating race. But no one bargained for the needle match that followed. This was a real eye opener for spectators and sailors alike. As you may have already seen, we covered this race as it unfolded stage by stage. And if you want to see the links, they're just up here. What we couldn't deal with at the time was the translations. So if you are wondering what the French had to say about the race, well, here's the official film with subtitles. Three, two, one. Ah, J'espère que le départ vous a plu. Il a vu la marque, la première marque Tester. Woo! 
un coup de chaud quand même au départ là. Nous on est parti pour faire du prêt, du vent et de la mer. A donc, à plus, ciao. Bon départ et bonne course à tout le monde. Merci. Si t'as pas le prêt, c'est pas la course qu'il faut faire. Ça mouille, ça tape, c'est du bateau à voile quoi. Ça devrait forcer encore là. Bon, assez tonique quand même ces, ces premières 24 heures. C'est un peu le champ de boss en ce moment, mais ça va vite. Il bon, y a les trois énervés derrière qui vont vite aussi. Hein. vers le nord-ouest. La mer s'est enfin calmée. On a dit qu'on s'entraînait euh, euh, sur un rythme vent des globes. Alors, je dis ça, on est quand même parti, on n'a pas lâché grand-chose. Hein. C'est tout gris. On va chercher euh, une autre dette qui va nous monter jusqu'en jusqu Islande. Ça vous donne envie Ouais. Pas sûr. Hein. Drôle l'endroit pour euh, les vacances d'été. Hein. Ça y est, on peut vivre à bord du bateau maintenant. Ce que je sais, c'est qu'il fait encore jour pour le coup. La, la, la froideur commence à s'installer. Hein. Donc des conditions vraiment variées sur cette Vendée Arctique, les sables. You can see. There is PRB. Et ben ça y est, on est dans le froid, je crois. Là, ça caille pas mal. Et donc, on a sorti un vrai bonnet d'hiver. Ben là, on est rentré dans le vif du sujet avec euh, du froid, des grains, l'image euh, de trait de côte de Groenland sur la carte. And it's time for our float to go in the water. Alors, voilà, on arrive au One Point UNESCO. Allez, vous regardez, vous allez voir. Non, je déconne. Il n'y a rien à voir. Il est virtuel. Bien sûr. Bon, deuxième finalement, deuxième finalement, il euh, y a Thomas qui nous a fait l'intérieur. Alors on est passé ce matin à la bouée UNESCO dans les eaux islandaises, en tête. Euh, après avoir remonté euh, les deux compères de devant, ben, je, suis, je suis bien content. Troisième position, voilà, ça aurait pu être mieux, mais Et la route est longue encore pour euh, le retour vers la maison. It's really, really nice sailing right now. La Sam qui est là, Boris. Et ça m'a donné une initiative. C'est parti pour la grande descente. En direction du sud. La mer par contre, je ne vous explique pas, c'est juste une machine à laver des vagues dans tous les sens. La baume de MACSF a... s'est cassée en deux. Évidemment, ma déception est immense. C'est pas toujours drôle la vie de marin, mais c'est pas fini. Euh, le vent va avoir du mal à... Oh là 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 Et euh, les trois petits copains, bah là, ils font parler la poudre. Ils sont là, ils sont là, tout proche. Ils se rapprochent, mais ils sont toujours derrière. Donc euh, voilà. Pour l'instant, pour l'instant ça va. Mais ouais, ça commence à devenir serré cette histoire. Vous voyez là, là juste là, il y a Kivia. Là, juste derrière, c'est Advance. Voilà, donc recouvrement général à la bouée, euh, enfin à la, à la marque qui est une
les gars. <rire> Moi, je ne suis pas, quoi. Hein. Je ne fais pas un Vendée Globe, ça sonne du jour, comme on a fait, comme on a fait là les 10 jours. And that was just a taster. In November, it's the big one, the Vendée Globe, the non-stop, single-handed, round-the-world race. We're going to be there all the way. If you've cruised or raced in coastal waters, the chances are that you've got a story to tell about snagging fishing gear, or at least coming close to it. We've all done it. But have you ever wondered how much gear gets lost or discarded? I bet you don't even come close. Experts estimate around 800,000 tonnes a year. It's called ghost gear. 11th Hour Racing is supporting Ocean Conservancy's Global Ghost Gear Initiative that partners with the Gulf of Maine Lobster Foundation and state fisheries to identify ghost gear hotspots using side scan sonar, which helps them recover the gear. But the initiative goes way beyond that, supporting the development of new technology aimed at preventing gear loss, such as a buoy designed to track fishing gear to alert fishermen when their gears move too far. To find out more, take a look at their websites. Over the last few years, we've seen some radical new shapes in the racing world, and the trend for more angular styles is now spreading into mainstream production cruisers. One of the latest production builders to adopt the more aggressive style is Bavaria with the recent launch of their C42, a new model that is a step change for this well-known European production builder. The C42's hard chines are one of several new design details. The designers claim that they increase stability when the boat heels to 15 to 20 degrees, making her both more powerful and more comfortable, especially upwind. Chines also provide more internal volume and deliver more space in the cabins and for stowage. They also create an impressive amount of space on deck too. So with a more powerful hull form plus a higher ballast ratio, Bavaria have been able to include a larger and more efficient sail plan too. All of which they say contributes to a step up in performance. The introduction of furling headsail systems over 50 years ago marked the start of a revolution in the sport. From cruisers to racers, sports boats to super yachts, there hasn't been a part of the sport that hasn't benefited. But perhaps the biggest effect has been in the super yacht world, where handling much bigger sails safely and efficiently became possible. As if removing a glass ceiling, the design and construction of bigger and faster boats has been on an upward trajectory ever since. The latest development has been with furling sails that don't sit on a stay but carry the load through the luff of the sail. But this has brought significant challenges, not least a big increase in the loads that the furlers now need to carry. For example, aboard a Southern Wind 96, the Reckman Furler Swivel for the cableless Genoa now needs to carry nine tonnes of load. To find out how furling experts Reckman developed their popular UD4 furler to carry triple the load but without being significantly heavier, head to their website. Since they started over 20 years ago, RS have become famous for leading the charge with the new development of high-performance dinghies. Dinghies like this one, the RS500, and many more. But their latest development has really caught quite a lot of people by surprise. It's not what you'd expect. So what is it? Well, it's a rib, but it's a rib with a difference. It's 100% electric. So I talked to the two joint CEOs of RS to find out a bit more. We've taken kind of our sailboat heritage and tried to engineer it and design it into a rib that is, yeah, completely electric. In one sense, the marine industry for electric boats has got the jump from the car industry because every marina in the world has pontoon power. So it's a conventional three-pin camping-style, marine-style plug. So charging from that was really important and that's what we've achieved. 
the Pulse 58 will do two hours running at 20 knots, a range of somewhere between 35 and 40 nautical miles. Obviously, if you reduce the speed to 10 knots, that grows massively. It would be more like 80 nautical miles, eight hours of running time. It definitely feels different. I think it just handles differently. You have some, definitely more torque at lower end. It just is, is really small differences. And if you're a good powerboat driver, you're gonna have no issue with it, absolutely. The hub drive or the rad drive is very efficient. It allows us to use electric motors in a certain way which we wanted to achieve. Because you have no exposed prop, you add an element of safety. And that also applies to the rad tag. So the rad tag is your, to most people that look at it and go, it's just like a kill cord on a normal boat. But the rad tag has a, has a, has a small chip in it which can be programmed. So if your harbour is limited to 10 knots, your rad tag can be limited to 10 knots. If you run a hire centre and you want to geo-fence where that boat can go, the rad tag can do that, so it limited the range and the speed. That can be per tag, per driver. So if you're working in a commercial environment and you want to ensure your drivers are using the boat correctly at the right speed in the right area, again, that can be controlled with a rad tag. So we think that's a key safety feature to support organisations that run commercial fleets. But it's not just the propulsion unit that's smart. The display is clever too. One thing that we've done is we've worked with Ray Marine on the like Gaxium 7-inch display. So what we've got here um, is a screen which clearly tells you uh, on the left hand side um, the percentage of your battery uh, and also it tells you in the ab above bar um, effectively how much power you are drawing. Also you've then got uh, a time of what is still remaining and what to maximise um, your distance is the speed which is the, the like optimum speed. Um, and then on the right hand side you've got your speed um, and then on the top bit you've also got what range um, you've got left to go and do depending on your speed and then on the top you've got your trip and your depth. You've also got the options of going to a chart and a dashboard so all of the plotter and all the bits and pieces will work on that so it will tell you where your range is and where you can get to. At 100,000 euros the Pulse 58 is not cheap but neither are electric cars yet. Once again, and as always, thank you so much for watching. Thank you also for all the comments that we've had so far. Please keep them coming. We love reading them. Please also make sure that you like us. Make sure that you subscribe to us. That also makes a big difference. In the meantime, I do hope that you manage to get out on the water. Keep well, stay safe, and until next time.